shaping precious metal into artisan jewelry is fun. And now, Kate Richburg shows you just how easy it can be. Learn the basic techniques for making a necklace, a bangle bracelet, and earrings. Today in Jewel School. Welcome to Jewel School. I'm Kate Richburg, jewelry designer, instructor, and author. You know, when I was a little girl, my grandmother always used to say, we can make that at home. And if you thought that fine jewelry was only something that you needed to purchase in a boutique, well then this class is for you, because I'm going to teach you how to make it right at home. I'm gonna teach you some very simple techniques that are gonna be really easy to understand and are gonna make some really beautiful jewelry. You'll learn to fashion wire into simple shapes and solder to components to make a necklace. Twist wire and stamp a blank to make a bangle bracelet. And make simple ear wires you can use to create a matching pair of earrings. Now before we get started on our projects, I want to review some of the tools with you and some of the things that we're going to need to actually get started and create. So, right in front of me, I have my soldering setup. Now it's a real simple soldering setup and it's the same one that I use at home when I'm making jewelry. I've got a butane microtorch. I've got a kiln brick as my soldering surface. I have a quenching cup that has a pair of soldering tweezers with it, and it's all sitting in this little pan. And I really like a pan as a soldering surface because this pan has a nice edge on it. And you know, as I'm soldering, if something happens to fall off of my kiln brick, the little edges of the pan are gonna really prevent that hot metal from rolling off onto my table, or more importantly, onto my lap. So a nice little pan with edges is the perfect thing to work with. I've got some other things here that I want to share with you. I've got some hammers. This is a plastic mallet, and that plastic mallet is great for hammering when you want to keep the shape of the metal, but you don't want to flatten the metal. For flattening and a little more aggressive shaping, I've got some metal hammers here, these forming hammers. This forming hammer here, and a chasing hammer. The chasing hammer has a little ball peen end on there that I like to use for texturing. It gives my metal a nice textured, like hammered looking surface, which I think looks nice. We use those hammers on this bench block. The bench block is a nice shiny piece of unmarked metal that supports our metal when we hammer it. And I've placed all of this on a mouse pad, and the mouse pad helps to dampen the noise as I'm hammering, so your family or your neighbors won't get irritated by all that hammering on metal that you're doing. Over here on this side, I've got some pliers. I've got some good cutters. These are a pair of flush cutters here. One's a little more heavy duty than the other. I've got some basic pliers, some chain nose, bent chain nose, and round nose pliers. And I've got some wrap and tap pliers, which are just large stepped pliers that help me curve my wire into nice round circles. I have a variety of files, metal files, salon boards like you'd use on your fingernails, and I've got some sandpaper and a couple of little metal polishing pads, and those are great to polish our metals up. I've got a nice little ruler here, and here's my solder. Now, for those of you who haven't used paste solder before, I think you're really going to like it for these projects. Traditionally, metal solder comes in wire and in sheet. And we have to cut that metal or wire right into little teeny tiny bits and place them right on the surface that we're going to solder. And we also have to paint some flux on that metal as well. So there are a lot of steps involved using that regular metal solder. But with paste solder, it's like just a one step and you're done. The flux is already in the paste and all you do is you use these metal solder picks to apply the paste to the surface of your metal and that's it. No extra flux needed, no cutting, nothing. It's just ready to go. I think you'll really enjoy using it.
And like traditional metal solder, it comes in three different grades that has three different melting points to it. It comes in easy, medium, and hard. And I'll explain a little bit more about which one to use at what time when we get to the projects. But before we get any further, you guys, I really wanna discuss a few tips on safety. You know, we're working with flame and fire, and so we want our space to be as safe as we can get it. So, first of all, if you have long hair, go ahead and tie it back. It's probably a good idea to wear some natural, breathable clothing just in case. It keeps you nice and comfortable. And you want to make sure when you're turning on your torch that we're aiming it at our soldering surface. You know, it's tempting to take the torch and kind of look at it and turn it on and then swing it around. Well, we don't want to do that. We really want to control the torch and the flame. So when we turn it on, point it at your soldering surface and make sure that there isn't anything combustible on your table that might catch fire. On the fire note, we'll take a look at our fire extinguisher. Now, it's really important to have a working fire extinguisher nearby just in case you need it. Make sure it's in good working order and that it's handy so you can reach it if you need to use it. I also have some safety glasses there. I wear glasses as I'm working, but if you don't, it's a good idea to have some safety glasses on to protect your eyes because we are using flame and we don't want any hot metal to jump up and hit you in the eye. We also have our pickling setup here. Now, when we heat our metal, the surface of the metal forms an oxide on the top, and that oxidation needs to be removed before we can go to the next step in our soldering process. So that's what the pickle does. We're using a granular acid called Sparex, and the Sparex is mixed in a small little hot pot with some water. We plug that pot in and the pickle solution gets heated up. It's about an eight to one ratio with the Sparex to water. So let's say I'll use a cup of water. I'll go ahead and use about an eighth of a cup of this granular Sparex. Now I have a, also a little bowl that has some rinse water in it. And to that rinse water, I add a little bit of baking soda. And that baking soda is gonna neutralize any of the acid solution that might be left on my metal, so my metal will be nice and clean and safe for me to touch once I take it out of the bowl. And most importantly, you guys, we wanna put the pieces in the little hot pot here with this pair of copper tongs. It's tempting to just grab your little um, stainless steel soldering tweezers and go ahead and put them in the solution. But if we do that, we're actually gonna add an electric charge to this pickle solution. And all of the oxidation that's come off of the metal that's floating around in the liquid here, if we put the stainless steel tweezers in, all of that oxidation is gonna jump right back onto your metal and make it all dirty again. So we don't want that to happen. So no stainless steel tweezers and no steel tools. Just your copper tongs and you'll be safe. Now, one last thing before we get started. The torch. Now some of you may have had some soldering experience before and that's great. But those of you who haven't, I just wanna go over how to turn this torch on so you'll feel comfortable. You know, if you're not real familiar with your torch, what I like to tell you is practice turning the torch on and off a few times before you actually get started using it on your projects. And I think you'll feel a little more confident. And you know what? That's half the battle. So to get started with the torch, we need to fill it with some butane. So I have my little butane container right here, and I'm gonna take the base off the bottom of my torch. Now, most butane torches work in a similar manner. So usually they have their little fueling opening right here at the bottom. And all you need to do is get the little stem of the butane and insert it right there into the little opening. And usually when I fill my torch, I like to step outside to be in the nice outdoor air. Um, there's not a lot of uh, fumes that come off of this, but I like to step outside and fill my torch up that way. 
Now, when I fill my torch, I count to about 10 or so, but you also may see a little bit of sputtering around the stem of this butane. That means that your torch is full and you just need to remove uh, the canister and your torch is ready to go. This torch is pretty full already, so I'm just gonna depress it just real quickly so you can see it and then we'll move on. Just like this. And that's all she wrote. Again, like I say, I count to about 10 and it should be full. I'm gonna put the lid back on this butane and I'm gonna keep it out of harm's way down here at the table by my side. That way it's out of the way of the flame of the torch. I wanna make sure and put the stand back on my torch because the stand makes this torch nice and stable. If it doesn't have the stand on it, it might easily be uh, pushed over. So it's nice to keep that on the end. Now, when we turn our torch on, we wanna make sure we've got our safety glasses on. But this particular torch has an ignition switch here, but it also has a safety switch on it. So if I go and I try and push the button to turn the torch on, it's not gonna happen. What I need to do is disengage the safety here and push the button to turn the torch on, just like that. But if I take my finger off of the button, you can see the flame goes out. So what I have here on this side is a little button that I need to push in order to lock the flame on. So I go ahead, disengage the safety, turn on the torch, and then push that little button back so the flame stays on. Now on this side of the torch, there's a little lever and that turns my flame up for larger projects and pushes my flame right down for projects that are smaller. And it's really important, that's one of the reasons I love this torch is that you can really adjust the flame to just be perfect for the job that you're doing. Now to turn this off, all I do is push that button forward and I check the tip to make sure that there isn't any little flame coming out of there. The flow of butane's off and the torch is off. Now, I always wanna set the torch facing away from me because the nozzle of this torch, now that I've turned it on, is hot. So if it's facing towards me, I might accidentally hit it with my wrist and burn myself, and I don't wanna do that. So always keep it facing away and it'll be much safer for you. All right, well, those are the tools that we need. Are you ready to get started with our projects? I sure am. Let's go. Let's get started on our Making Shapes necklace project. I think you're really gonna like this one. The component that we're making is a really basic one that you can use with a lot of different designs, but I think it looks really great attached to chain. So let me show you a little bit about what we're gonna need to make it and talk a little bit about the project. You can see right over here by my side, I've got the necklaces all ready to go. And you can see I've embellished them with some freshwater pearls. Now you can use any beads of your choice and any chain of your choice, but I think the freshwater pearls really look nice with these sterling silver components. You can also see that I've done three of the components that are scattered throughout the necklace, and they're a little offset. They're set a little asymmetrically. Now, you could, if you liked, set them so they're very even across, or you could add more of the components, or you could add fewer of the components. You can make the chain longer or shorter. Just adapt it to whatever look that you like. So. What we're gonna need to make that is some wire. And what I have here is about 12 inches of 14 gauge dead soft wire. You could use half hard wire, but I actually prefer dead soft for this project. I feel it is a little bit easier to shape those um, round circles using the dead soft. Sometimes the half hard is a little springy. I have some 20 gauge here it's about four inches or so. That's what I'm gonna to use to make my jump rings. And I have some 24 gauge fine silver wire to make my head pins. 
and I need about 10 inches, 12 inches or so of this to do the dangles. And about 16 inches or so of my sterling silver chain. And whatever chain you choose, you wanna make sure that the link in the chain is large enough so you can get your jump ring through. And then finally, we're gonna need a finished clasp. Make sure that clasp is sterling silver and not silver plated so it'll survive the heat of the torch. And you're gonna need some pearls. And right here, I have six pearls that I'm gonna use. I also have a couple of new tools that I wanna introduce you to that we're gonna be using for this project. This is a millimeter gauge, and that's just gonna help me share with you the different sizes of the loops that I'm gonna make. I'll show you how to use that. As well as this ring mandrel. That's gonna actually help me shape my soldered loops into nice round circles. All right, that's all of the tools and materials that we're gonna need for this project, so let's jump in. We're gonna start off by making the loops of the component parts of this project. So I'm gonna grab my 14 gauge wire and work with that. Slide all my other little parts over here because we're gonna need those shortly. But first, let's focus on this wire. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and use my large wrap and tap wire. And I'm gonna use my millimeter gauge and I'm gonna come in and measure the largest part of my wrap and tap here, just so you know what size these loops are gonna be. It's just a little more than about three quarters of an inch or about 20 millimeters. And you know, if you don't have one of these pliers at home, just go ahead and find a dowel or something else that's about that size to wrap your loops around. So, let me grab my wire, and I'm gonna place it right in between the heads of my plier, just like so. And I'm gonna rotate the plier and shape the wire to the head of the tool. And you can see why dead soft wire works so nicely here. It really just conforms beautifully to the head of this plier. All right, once I've made my little coil, we need to go ahead and cut that coil apart for the rings. This is a flush cutter, a flush wire cutter, and this is the side of the cutter that cuts flush. And we need these rings to be cut flush because when we're soldering, the two seams of our piece need to be perfectly flush together. If there's a little gap in the wire and you think, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna shove some solder in there and that's gonna close up that gap. You know what? That doesn't work. Solder does not flow to fill that gap. What you need to do is make sure that your seams are completely, completely joined. If you do that, then you'll be all set for success. So I'm gonna use this flush cutter to clip my rings apart. I'm gonna go ahead and clip and I'm gonna just check my little cut that I've made here, and I wanna make sure that the cut is going straight up and down and not at an angle. So I'm just gonna recut that to make sure that's just perfect. So it's a nice straight across cut. I'll go ahead and flip my cutter and clip away another ring. And you can see how nice and clean that cut is, a nice super flush cut. Now we need to do that two more times to make two more rings. Now I've got all three of my rings here that are ready to be soldered. So let's pull in our soldering setup and get those going. Now the solder that I'm gonna choose is hard solder because I'm gonna solder these. These are gonna have a couple of solder steps done to them. So my hard solder actually flows at the highest temperature. So that means when I solder this closed and then I go ahead and solder something else to this ring, I'm gonna use medium solder up here. The medium solder is gonna flow because the flow point is a lot lower. It's gonna flow and solder 
before the join that I made with the hard solder comes undone. So you always wanna use those solder in those steps. You wanna go from hard to medium to easy, which flows the fastest. Now remember how I talked about making sure that our little break in this ring is nice and flush. Just for a little extra added assurance, as I go and tension these rings to hold them together, see how I'm tensioning them back and forth. I kind of come in here and I bounce the ring back and forth. And that's work hardening the opposite end of this ring so that when I come in and snap the little ends together, they're gonna sit nice and tight, just like that. Sometimes though, if your join is a little open, this one actually looks pretty good, but I go ahead and I spread the ring open and I tension it on my little sandpaper. This is about a 600 grit sandpaper, so it's not too rough. It'll just take off any little burr that might prevent this ring from soldering closed nicely. And all I do is, I just come in and pull that sandpaper back and forth to help to detail that seam, just like so. And I'm gonna bounce this ring back and forth a couple more times, and now I'm gonna pop it, look at that, right into place. And I'm checking it to make sure that all of the seam is nice and even and flush at all angles. Now let's pull in our soldering setup here. Now what I like to do is, I like to solder this piece so that my join is facing away from me. And what that does is, it actually makes me heat this ring really thoroughly. Because if I was just focusing my flame right here on the join, the back part of the ring would actually stay cool and it would act like a heat sink. It would just keep pulling the heat away from where it needs to be at the join to get that solder to flow. So if I have the join pointing away from me, I always know that I have to bring my torch around and around to keep the heat evenly distributed and so that my solder flows nice and evenly. So let's get our hard solder and I use the red solder pick with my hard solder. And I'm gonna extrude a little bit of that solder right onto the tip of my pick. Just like so. And this is about maybe a two millimeter size of a ball of solder here. I'm just gonna come on in and place it right on the solder join. Now, this is what you're gonna look for, because you know what, this is gonna go so quickly because this wire is really thin. When I turn on my torch, I'm just going to slowly introduce the torch so that the flame gradually heats up the ring. And what you're gonna see is the solder is gonna smoke a little bit and it may even pop up a little bit of flame, but that's okay, that's just the binder burning away as the solder is drying. So I just keep going through that, keep moving my torch and I'm gonna move my torch nice and slowly and as I come around, what I'm gonna see is the solder is gonna run like a little molten line of silver. As soon as I see that, you guys, I need to pull my torch back because if I'm hovering my torch around, really watching that solder flow, I'm gonna burn right through this ring. And it's no big deal if I do. I'll just get another one, cut it, and re-solder, but we're gonna try and be successful right from the get-go. So remember, as soon as you see that little solder run, remove the torch. And one last thing, as you're heating and as the solder is running, Remember that molten solder follows the heat of the torch flame. So I'm just gonna pop my flame over the ring and back to make sure that that solder gets pulled all the way through the join so that the solder join is nice and sturdy. So let's try it. I'm gonna put on my glasses here and I'm gonna pop on my torch. And I don't need my torch to be turned up really super high. I'm gonna put it up just a little bit. And I wanna show you this flame here. 
you can see where the flame comes to a nice tapered light blue cone. Right at the tip of that cone is where the sweet spot or the hot spot of the flame is. So that's what I want kind of touching around the edge of my metal. That's gonna be the most effective heating part of my flame. So I don't wanna go beyond that. I wanna stick right there at the tip of the flame. So let's go. I'm coming in, gradually introducing. You can see that solder has dried a little bit. It kind of fell over to the side, but as long as it's still touching my metal, I'm not worried about it. Inching that flame in, bringing it around and around. And you can see, oh, it's almost ready to flow. And there it goes, just like that. And you can see that little molten solder run. I'm gonna pull my torch back and forth across the join and turn off my flame. And we should be all set to go. I'm gonna go ahead and quench because that ring is hot. And before I put it in the pickle, I'm gonna go ahead and just check it to make sure that it's soldered. And you can see here, as I move that, I try and move that seam back and forth, it's not budging. It's perfectly soldered. All right, let's pickle and clean it up. Now next, with these two, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna solder both of these joins one at a time. Apply solder to each join, then heat each ring until the solder flows. Quench and pickle. Now I have all three rings soldered and they should be clean and ready to go. So let me grab them right out of here and just go ahead and rinse them in my rinse water. There we go, all three of those guys. And let's dry them off and let's take a look at what we've got. There we go, that looks pretty nice. They're all nice and soldered and nice and secure. But now we really need to get them nice and round. Um, a couple of these look pretty good, but I'm gonna shape all of them so they all kind of look the same. And that's where this ring mandrel comes in. So I'm gonna start off by getting one of my rings and just sliding it right on down the ring mandrel, just like so. I'm gonna use my plastic mallet and I'm just gonna give it a few light taps as I turn the ring mandrel to get it nice and round. Once it's nice and round, I'll go ahead and I'll lay it right on my bench block here. And I'll tap it so it's nice and even. And I'll flip it over, give it one more tap just like so. Now I wanna do that with my two remaining rings. Round each ring on the mandrel, then even them out on the bench block. Perfect. Now that all three rings have a nice round shape to them, I'm gonna go ahead and get one of my forming hammers and flatten these rings. Now, you could leave your ring nice and round, but I like a little bit of texture on mine. So all I'm gonna do is place it on the surface of my bench block and grab my hammer and give it some light strikes. You wanna let the weight of the hammer do the work here, you guys. You don't wanna kind of choke up on the head of this and pound it like that. All you wanna do is hold the plier right here at the end and let the head of the hammer fall down and do its job. You don't need to strike it really hard. We're not building a house. All we're doing is giving this jewelry a couple of nice light taps. And see how I'm controlling the hammer? As I'm tapping with this hammer, I'm moving my little component 
rather than moving my hammer all over the place. If I keep the hammer in one place and move the piece, I have a little more control. And I'll go ahead and flip it over and hammer a little bit on the other side. Now once this piece is flattened out, I can go ahead and use the little ball side of my chasing hammer. And you know, either of these hammers will work to flatten this piece out. This one was a little bit heavier, so I wanted to move that metal a little bit more. So that's why I chose this one. But this one here has a little bit of a, a smaller ball on the end, and that'll give me a nice hammered texture. So I'll go ahead and use this one for that. Again, just small little strikes. Tap and turn. There we go. Now I'm only gonna hammer one side of this ring, so this will actually be the top side of the ring. And if you'll notice, what I didn't do, I didn't do any filing on the seam here because you can see as I tapped it out with my hammer, that seam really compressed and almost disappeared. But if you do want to have just a little more detail on that seam, I'll go ahead and grab my metal jeweler's file and give it a couple of swipes just to make sure it looks really good. This is my half round jeweler's file. And as I file, I'm just gonna go ahead and file in one direction. It files on the forward stroke, let up when the file comes back. And since this is a half round file here, I can also use it to file the interior of my ring. And if I need to detail that just a little bit more, I can use any of my other files that I have Sometimes I just like taking my little fine sandpaper here and just swiping it along the inside of the ring and along the outside. Just like so. And I'm gonna do that with my remaining two rings. Now all three of my rings are ready to go to the next step. We're gonna go ahead and add our little half jump rings to either end to complete the components. And the way that we do that is, I'm just gonna grab my 20 gauge wire and I'm going to make some jump rings using my small wrap and tap plier. Now the smallest head on this wrap and tap gives me a jump ring with an inside diameter of about five millimeters, which I like for the little edges of the components. So I'm gonna need six little half rings, but I'm gonna make a coil that has four or five loops on it, just in case I need them. And there's my little coil. Now, just like I cut these rings previously, I'm gonna do the same thing, cutting apart this coil. Only this time, I'm gonna cut the rings in half instead of full round ones. So, back to the flush cutter. Come in, and if your coil is a little tight, you can go ahead and open it up a little bit so the point of your tool is able to get in there. So I'll come in Clip it straight across so it's flush. And do the same thing over here. Clip away that little point. And 
around the same over there. And just continue until you have six little half rings. Now that we have all of our little rings cut, I wanna go ahead and just flatten these out just a little bit to give them a little bit of dimension here. They're also a little bit, a little wavy, so this will also help them to sit nice and flush up against that bigger ring. Just a couple of little taps is all they need. We don't want them to be too thin, but I do want them to kind of match the style of my big ring. Now, we need to make these little half rings fit right up against these larger rings. And that involves using our, our flush cutter one more time. And I'm gonna just push my little half ring right up against the ring and check the join. I can see that it fits pretty well, but I actually wanna cut just the tiniest of little slants, little diagonals into the ends of these rings, just so they fit nicely around the curve of the loop. And you can hardly tell, but I've cut just the smallest of little slants and that really makes this fit perfectly. And when I place these for soldering, I'm gonna have the join that I soldered right here on the side of the ring and solder these little half rings to the bottom and the top so they're not butting up against that original solder join. So I'm just gonna clip them ever so slightly. There we go. And let's solder these on and take a look at how it comes out. Now, I used hard solder to solder the ring closed. What solder do you think I use this time? That's right, medium solder, because this is the next step in my soldering sequence. So I'm just gonna come in and push my little ring right up to the component. Just like that, so it's nice and flush up against it. And I'll use my yellow soldering pick with my medium solder. Extrude a little bit of that. I don't need too much, maybe about a one millimeter size ball or so. And I'm gonna go ahead and place that solder right at the join where the half ring meets the big ring. Just a little bit more there. There we go. Now, another way that you can place the solder, I wanna show you two ways and you can kind of decide what works for you. What I can also do is use my little soldering tweezers here and scoop up some solder right on the ends of this little ring, this little half round ring. Then I can drop it and push it forward so it meets my component. There we go, just like that. I'm gonna move a little bit of that solder over there we go, just perfect. Now, when we're heating this, the thing I want you to remember is this ring is pretty big and these little half rings are a lot smaller. So I'm just gonna concentrate my heat running around this large ring here. I'm not gonna really avoid these smaller rings, but I don't need to put the torch right on them. I'm just gonna keep going because I, I don't want these small rings to melt and it's gonna go pretty quickly. So let's go ahead and pop this on and start to heat. 
introduce the torch slowly so the solder doesn't pop off. And now once it starts to heat, you can get in there a little bit tighter. And as the torch comes around, see how there's the solder flowed there and the solder flowed there. I just want to move the flame around just to make sure that the solder flows everywhere I want it to go. But that looks like we've done it. Let's go ahead and quench them. Quench this guy up. And let's take a look and make sure that everything is, fits together nicely. Wiggle and wiggle. Yep. It's on there. Perfect. Next, I'm going to pickle that and solder my next two components. Okay, my last two pieces are all soldered and ready to clean. So I'm gonna throw those right in the pickle pot to clean them up. And while we're waiting for those, I'm gonna show you how to make the head pins that we adorn our, our little necklace with, our little chain that our pearls go on to. So I've got some 24 gauge fine silver wire here. And I like using fine silver for my head pins because it balls up really nicely. Fine silver is pure silver. It's not alloyed with copper like the sterling silver that we were using. So you're not gonna see these have any fire scale on the surface. And it also gives me a nice round ball to make a perfect head pin. So I'm gonna cut about two inches of wire for each little pearl. And I've got six pearls sitting over here. So I'm gonna cut six pieces of the wire. There we go. So now to make the head pins, they go pretty quickly because the wire is so thin. So let me just show you how we do that. I go ahead and I hold the wire right here in my soldering tweezer. And I want to make sure that I'm working over my fireproof surface. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to aim my torch kind of up at an angle and I'm going to bring my wire right in. And as soon as that wire hits the flame, the little end is going to ball up. And so I stop pretty quickly because I don't want that ball to get too big. So here goes. Let's turn on our torch. And let's form that head pin. Coming in and balling up that wire. Look at how quickly that went. That's all there is to it. Come right on in and ball it up. And that's it. Pretty simple. Let's pull them out of the quenching bowl. And now they're ready to work with. So I'm going to set them aside right here next to my pearls. Now I bet our components are all clean and ready to use. So let me go ahead and pull those out of the pickle. Make sure they're all rinsed off. And let's dry them off here. I think these look good. So now these are all ready to add onto my chain. I'm gonna make some more jump rings now to bring all of these components together. I'm gonna to use some more of my 20 gauge and 
This time, I'm gonna make my jump rings a little bit smaller. I'm gonna use my round nose plier here, and I'm just gonna make a smaller coil. The inside diameter of these rings is about four millimeters or so, but it just depends on the size of chain that you're using. But I like to use 20 gauge for these. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a little coil. I'm gonna need one jump ring for each connection here. So that's six plus one for the end and one for the clasp. So that's eight. So I'm gonna wind maybe about nine jump rings or so. Just like that. I'm gonna go ahead and clip them away using that flush cutter just like we've done so many times before. All right, each component has its own little ring. So now I'm gonna lay this piece out to see how I want to space all of these rings. Now, like I said earlier, you can decide how you want to place these rings if you want them to be symmetrical along the chain, asymmetrical, however you want to do it. And remember, you can add length anywhere along this project as well, whatever it is that you want to do. But I'm going to place my first component, looks like about right here, and let me measure from the end of my chain to where I'm gonna put that first component, it's gonna be about five inches or so. So I'm gonna come in, and I know that this one's gonna go right there. Then my second component, I'm going to have about three inches of wire or so. Clip that away, and that's where this one's gonna go. In between this one and this one, I'm gonna give myself about an inch. Just like that. And then I'm gonna have the remainder of this chain right over here, just like so. Next, I wanna show you how to attach the clasp to the ends of these chains. I'm gonna go ahead and solder this jump ring on that end and this jump ring right here for the clasp. Let's start with the clasp. Let's put these aside to use for later and pull in our soldering tray. Now I'm just gonna grab my chain nose and bent chain nose pliers And I'm just gonna bring this jump ring in. I've made this jump ring actually just a little bit smaller to connect the chain to the clasp. I'm gonna open it up. Add it to the end of my chain and then go ahead and slide my clasp on. Now I'll close it up. Remember, we need that ring to sit nice and flush or else it won't solder closed. Looks good. Now, I have this little depression here in my kiln brick. And the way I did that was I got my soldering tweezer and I kind of carved that little depression out. This really helps to protect my little clasp as I'm soldering. And again, I'm pointing that join away from my clasp because I don't want to accidentally solder these pieces to the ring, 
all I want to do is solder that ring closed. So my little clasp here is nice and stable in that little depression I've made. This time I'm going to use easy solder. It'll flow really fast. And since the chain and everything is so delicate, you want to get in and out with your torch there. Get a little bit of that solder and apply it right on your jump ring. There we go. And make sure that that jump ring doesn't move too much. That looks good. And now let's solder it. I'm going to turn the torch down so my flame is pretty small because again, this is a small piece. We don't need that much heat. So I'm going to pull this way down so I don't melt anything. And it's going to happen in a flash, you guys. So watch closely. Here I come. Heating gradually. You can see that little solder starts to kind of settle in there. I'm going to get just a little closer. Heat the piece. And can you see how that solder just ran just perfectly, just like that? And since my torch was so low, nothing else was in danger of melting. Let's go ahead and quench that. Now, there's no need to pickle this right now. I'm going to just make sure and connect all of my pieces together. Then I'm going to go ahead and put this in the pickle pot for a final pickle. Let me go ahead and add the jump ring on this end. Same thing, only this time we're not adding a clasp. It's just the jump ring for the final bit here at the end of our chain. Add on the chain and close the ring back and forth, just like you did with the larger links that we made the components out of. There we go. That joins pointing far away from the chain. Paste solder, the easy paste solder one more time. Add it right there where it goes. And let's fire up the torch. And there you have it. It's as easy as that. I'm going to go ahead and quench this and drop it in. Now we're ready to put all of these pieces together. Now remember, you could solder these jump rings with these components on this chain. But I think this is going to be pretty sturdy. So I'm just going to put all of these together for you. Go ahead and open the ring, add a component, and then add your chain. Now my components have a front and a back because I hammered on the top of these guys. So I need to make sure that all of my components are facing the right way. I need that small piece. So let's add this on. And you know, to really close the rings nice and tightly, what I'm doing here is I have one side of the ring in my bent chain nose plier, and I have the other just straight chain nose plier here. And I'm just going to come in and grab onto the sides of the rings. And I'm rotating those rings back and forth, and also kind of pushing them together at the same time. And as I have that back and forth movement, just like they did in these big rings here, it kind of work hardens the opposite side of this ring. So the ring gets a little work hardened and keeps everything closed. Because again, I want it to be nice and flush and sturdy. And I'm going to continue doing the same thing. Add the chain, work the ring right back and forth there to connect it. Now I'll go ahead and finish connecting 
the rest of my components. Okay, we're almost there, you guys. We're super close. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw this in the pickle pot one last time to get all of the fire scale off. I'm gonna let that do its thing. And I wanna show you how I'm gonna wire wrap or get these pearls ready to wire wrap on the chain. Now I've got these little head pins that I've made previously. And I'm just gonna slide my little pearl right on that head pin. Now, I'm gonna use my regular chain nose plier to just sit right at the tip, right on top of my pearl. I'm gonna push my wire right over my plier here so I get a nice little neck that I'm going to come after I've made the loop. I'm gonna wire wrap around that neck. Now to make the loop, I just grab my round nose plier, put it in, and at whatever diameter I want these loops to be, that's where I push them over the head of the tool. So I don't want these loops to be too big, so I'm not going up too far on the head. I just flip that little pearl around and I pull this wire right underneath so it's nice and round. And you can see I've made that loop, but it's not quite as centered as I'd like it to be. So I'm just gonna go ahead, give it a little bit of a twist so that everything is nice and ready to go. Now you might be tempted to finish wire wrapping this dangle at this point, but don't do it because if you wire wrap it closed, you're not gonna be able to add it to the chain. So we're just gonna leave it right like this. And let's see if our necklace is ready. I bet it is. Here we go, clean and ready. Rinse and dry it off. There we go, this is looking terrific. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and add all of my dangles onto my chain but I wanna make it pretty easy for me to polish. So I'm actually gonna polish this piece before I add the rest of my little dangles. Now this is a little pro polish pad that I have here. It's just a little foam square that has a little bit of polishing compound in it. And it has a little bit of tooth on the surface. So it gives a nice polish to your metals. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in and you really wanna make sure that your piece is dry before you start using these Pro Polish pads. If you use them on a wet piece, it's no good. These pads will leave a residue all over. Look at what happens, just that little rubbing, that little buffing of the pad, and I start getting some nice shine on my silver. So I'm gonna shine this piece up and you know, you could throw this piece in a tumbler as well if you wanted to polish it up a little bit more. But you know what, it's not too much to work on. So I think hand polishing makes this look just perfect. So now this is ready to add our dangles. So I had this wire wrap started but remember, we didn't wanna wire wrap this closed yet. We wanted to keep it open so we could come in and attach it to our chain. So I'm gonna go two links up, one and two, and add it on. Hold it there with my chain nose plier and wrap using my bent chain.
There we go. I'm just wrapping in little kind of 180 degree circles. And once I've filled up that little neck with wire wrapping, I'm going to come in, clip my excess wire away, and that little burr that's right there, I'm just going to use my chain nose plier and push that in. And look at that, there's one pearl on. It looks terrific. Now I'm gonna add my other pearls. First, you'll need to make a loop at the top of each one. Now let's put them in place. And we're gonna wrap them up. This wire is so soft that sometimes I also just use my fingers rather than using my other plier. Just depends on what you prefer. Okay, so here is your beautifully soldered, wire wrapped, embellished shapes necklace. I think it looks just terrific. In this segment, you're going to learn how to make a twisted wire bangle. It's a great project and I know you're gonna love it. You're gonna learn how to twist some heavy gauge wire, form that wire, and learn how to solder it just perfectly together so it matches up just beautifully. You're also gonna learn how to embellish that bangle bracelet by stamping a little charm and then soldering it on so it dangles off the bracelet. Let me show you what you're gonna to need to use. We're gonna need some 18 gauge wire. Now I have 72 inches of the wire here that I've cut into two 36 inch lengths. I have a short piece of 18 gauge wire here to make a jump ring. And then I have a little pre-made blank here that we're going to stamp and solder onto the bangle with that jump ring that we've made. I also have some new tools that I'm gonna introduce you to in this segment. I've got some design stamps as well as a one pound brass mallet that I'm gonna to use to strike those design stamps with to embellish our little metal tag. All right, are you ready to get started? So am I, let's go. Okay, so the first thing we need to do to get this bangle going is to twist the wire. So I've got my 18 gauge wire here in front of me. And you know, you could use wire that's a little bit thicker if you wanted to, but I think 18 gauge makes a really nice twist. So here are my two pieces that I've cut into those 36 inch lengths. Now to twist the wire, we're gonna use a tool that I know you have laying around your house, which is a fine household drill. I'm gonna show you how that works and it's gonna make a beautiful twist in your wire. But we also need something to anchor our wire onto as we twist it. And you also may be familiar with this tool right here. This is just a simple bench pin. And usually I use it to support my metals as I am sawing them. But for today, we're actually gonna use it upside down so I can adhere or attach my wire right here to this little loop. This little clamp just goes through the pin like that and sits nice and snug. And like I said, usually I'd put it up so this is facing up, but this time I'm gonna turn it over. So let's get that right on the table here. And we're gonna clamp it down nice and tight. And this makes a nice tight hold for my wire. There we go, nice and sturdy. Now I'm going to get my two pieces of that 18 gauge 
and I'm gonna string them right through the loop on my bench pin. And I'm gonna make sure that everything is nice and even because the more even your wires are at this point, the better the twist is gonna be. So see here how I'm just kind of smoothing everything down. Now at this end, I want to even everything out to make sure that when I put the wire into the chuck of my drill, that everything is still sitting nice and evenly. So I'm gonna come in. and cut those pieces away, and you can see how nice and even those look. All right, now here's when the magic happens, you guys. So we're gonna place the ends of our wire right into the chuck of the drill. Nice and tight, so they're nice right inside there. And I'm gonna tighten it down just like I would on a drill bit or something like that. Nice and tight. There we go. And you want to check and make sure that nothing's pulling out. And we're all ready to go. So I'm going to just depress the power button nice and slow. And look at how that's starting to twist up. And you want it to just evenly twist, go nice and slow. And look at that nice twist that's happening in the wire here. And I'm pulling back a little bit on the drill, so it's giving me a little bit of resistance, so I'm getting a nice twisted wire here. Look at that. That's looking great. Now you don't want to over twist, so I would stop just when you think that everything's looking pretty nice and even for you. I think that looks pretty good. Let's open this up and free our wire. We're gonna cut it off of the bench pin here. Just like that. And you know, on my samples that I have over here, I've made one of the bangles out of copper. And you know, copper is a great practice wire to work with. You know, I'm working with sterling silver here, and sometimes it can get a little expensive. So copper is a great way to practice. So if you haven't done this twisting before, it might be a good idea to grab some copper wire and just see how it twists up for you before you jump on into your sterling. So here's our piece of twisted, wonderful silver wire. And now we need to figure out how long to make it or how large to make it and cut it so it fits our wrist. Let me show you how to do that. You're gonna need a tape measure. And I bet you have one of those right at home as well. Now, in order for a bangle to fit over your hand and onto your wrist, you need to measure your hand right at the widest point, which is right over your knuckles. So I'm just gonna come in, put my little tape measure between two of my fingers, and wrap it round. And then kind of slip that out. And let's just check and see what the size is. Now I want to be able to slide this uh, bangle on and off, so it looks like I'm just shy of eight, well, about shy of about eight inches or, or so. And I actually want to make it just maybe about a quarter of an inch smaller than that, because as I hammer my piece out, it's going to grow a little bit. So I'm going to cut my wire at about seven and seven eighths of an inch or so, and that'll give me a little bit of room to grow. So let's transfer that measurement onto this tool. Some of you may know what this is, but for those of you who don't, meet the bracelet mandrel. Now the bracelet mandrel is a great tool to help you really size and shape this bangle. And it's just, I think, a great tool to have in your arsenal. So remember that measurement that we had of about seven and seven eighths, or whatever your measurement is. But I'm gonna close my tape measure at about that size, which is about right there. That's gonna be the circumference I need to get my wire to. 
I'm going to come in using my permanent marker and just make a little mark there so I know right here. I know where to wrap my wire. You can see I've made just that little mark right there. So now I've got my wire, twisted wire, and I'm going to neaten up the end before I wrap. And this part's a little wavy here, so I'm going to cut it right where my wire starts to look kind of nice. I'm going to clip it. And I can set this wire aside and use it for something else later, maybe hammer that out or use that for something else, that little twist. But now you can see I have a nice flush cut on the end of this wire. I'm just going to come in, wrap it around my bracelet mandrel right at the point where it was measured. And then I'm going to use my permanent marker to mark my wire. And the cool thing about a bangle is, is that it doesn't have to fit exactly, exactly right. So if you're off just a little bit, it's not going to make the biggest difference in the world. It'll still fit you. All right, I've made that little mark so I know where I need to cut it. So we're going to put our friend the bracelet mandrel aside for just a moment, but we're going to need it in a few minutes. But I'm going to cut using my flush cutter. This is a more heavy duty flush cutter. I'm going to come in and give this wire a cut. And you can see I have two nice flush ends there. But this twisted wire that I've made is made up of actually four different pieces of wire. So remember, when we're soldering, we need to make sure that our join is completely flush. So not only do we need to make sure that the join is flush this way, but I want to see if I can make all four of those little wires line up perfectly so I have a nice, even seam there. So I'm going to start tensioning this. Pretend this is like just one big jump ring, right? I'm just going to go ahead and tension, moving back and forth this way, moving it back and forth this way. That's work hardening the opposite end of this ring. So when I pull it together, like this, everything's going to pop into place. But notice here how it's kind of going up like this. Well, I have a trick to fix that. I'm going to show that to you. I'm going to get my bent chain nose or your regular chain nose, any flat plier will do. And I'm just going to curve those ends down just slightly. And I'm going to try not to disturb too much how the ends of the wire are sitting. So that's tensioned and I'm going to bring it together one more time. And we're going to check the seam. Now I can see, now this twisted wire is tricky to get it just, just right so it's ready to solder. Here I can see that this side of my bangle, this side of my wire, it's a little bit of a slant. Now I could file it, but I think my best bet is to give it one more little cut. Your bangle. Thank goodness it doesn't have to fit perfectly. So we have a little bit of wiggle room if we need to do some trimming. All right, let's bring this guy together and see what we've got. Okay, good. This is looking pretty good. But I just want to make sure that we are right on the money with that join. So I'm going to take my salon board here. It's a little bit uh, more of a coarse grit. I'm going to tension my ring right around it. And I'm just going to give myself a few swipes of this file. And again, the, the wire on this piece 
is pretty soft. So just a few swipes is all it takes. Let's double check that fit. All right. It looks like my little twists are meeting up pretty well also, which is good. All righty. I think we're ready to go. So let's clear our space and get any combustible materials out of the way. Move my little extra parts over. I'm gonna use hard paste solder to solder this. Make sure that that join is flush. And you wanna make sure that your piece is flush on all sides, not only sitting straight together, but flush this way and flush this way as well. That looks pretty good. So now we're gonna use some hard solder. I'm gonna extrude a little bit of solder out and grab it with my solder pick. This is about a two millimeter size or so. I'm gonna apply it right on the seam here. Now remember that little trick that we do when we're soldering, we're gonna go all the way around, solder it all the way around, and then we're going to put the flame right on the join to make sure that the solder flows all the way through. I added just a touch more so you can see what I've got there. Now I'm gonna add my glasses, put my glasses on so I can be nice and safe. And I have the join pointing away from me so that ensures that I'm heating up the whole piece evenly. And let's get this started. Pop on my torch. Now, this is a pretty big bracelet here. It's, it has a pretty large opening. So I need my flame to be just a little bit bigger. So it really heats things up nicely and evenly. I'm gonna slowly introduce that flame. Thoroughly heating the piece. And now as I come around, I can see my metal is starting to get a little hot. It's close, real close. There we go. And I can also of detail that with my solder pick to make sure that helps my solder flow right where I want it to go. That looks good. I'm going to go ahead and quench it and let's pickle it. I like that noise. Check the seam. Looks good. We're gonna go ahead and clean it up in the pickle. Now, while that's cleaning, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna stamp that little charm and make a jump ring to connect it to that bangle. I'm gonna bring my bench block to the fore here, and I'm gonna take it out of the rubber backing. Now, the bench block, when you're stamping, you really want your bench block to be on a sturdy table directly on the surface of the table. Any little padding underneath it is really going to cause the design stamp as you're stamping it to kind of jump around. So we want that nice sturdy surface underneath providing that resistance. Now I have some letter stamps here, so I'm just going to stamp my name right here. So I've got my blank right on the surface of my bench block 
And I'm just gonna go ahead and I use the little blank kind of like a little mirror so I can see where I'm placing that stamp and I grab my brass mallet. This is a one pound mallet and we want to use a hammer like this, not your fancy jewelry making hammers like these. The stamps will mark the heads of those tools. You want to use something that the head can get nice and marked on. So I'm going to come in, it's going to be a little bit of a loud noise. I'm going to give it one sturdy strike. And there I've got a K. I'm going to move on down my second stamp. Whoops, strike that. Moved around a little bit, but it still looks good. Let's get the T in there. And the E. You can see that's all stamped. And now I'm gonna add just a couple of more little decorative elements to it. So let's make the jump ring to connect this blank to our bangle. I've got some 18 gauge wire. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab my round nose plier here. And I'm gonna make a little coil and about where the head of the tool is about five millimeters or so. So I'm gonna come in, rotate the tool, and I just need one jump ring really, so I think this should be plenty. I'm gonna grab my flush cutter and free a jump ring right off that coil. Remember the flush side of the cutter is here I'm gonna come in and cut that excess wire away, put it aside, flip the tool, and cut the other side of the ring. So that's all ready to go. Now let's check the status of our bracelet that's in the pickle here. Looks nice and clean. Give it a little rinse. And I wanna dry it off. There we go, that looks great. But it sure doesn't look like a bangle yet, does it? We need to actually shape it. So that's where our friend, the bracelet mandrel comes back in. So I'm just gonna place my bangle right on the mandrel and I'm gonna slide it on down and see it's just slightly above where I made that mark. So that means we're right on the money. I'm gonna grab my plastic mallet and I'm gonna slide my mouse pad over here just to give this tool a little bit of padding. And I'm just gonna gently tap and rotate so the bangle gets nice and round. Now, you can see that the piece is nice and round here, but let's also make it nice and flat going this way. So I'm gonna just come in with my plastic mallet and just even everything out. And notice how the plastic mallet, while it's helping to get everything into shape, it's not flattening the wire. The wire still looks nice and round. Now, you have the option of just stopping here, really, if you like a bangle that looks a little more like a rope, that looks kind of round. But if you'd like to have it a little flatter, you can go ahead and bring it back to your bracelet mandrel.
and just hammer around to flatten out your wire. And I'm going to use this forming hammer and just a few light taps while I'm turning this mandrel will do it. And I like how this twisted wire looks when it's flattened just a little bit. You don't want to tap on it too hard, just enough to really get it into a nice, a nice shape. And let's flatten it out there one more time. And this is going to square off those ends just a little bit. Terrific. So you can see how nice that twist is really looking in the wire bangle. So now let's add that little embellishment. So we're done with the bracelet mandrel for now. And let's pull our little tag and our little jump ring. I'm going to go ahead and open that jump ring up. Slide the tag on. And slide the jump ring on the bangle. Make sure that your jump ring is flush and sitting together nicely. This looks nice and closed and ready. And I'm going to go ahead and solder this guy closed. Now, we soldered the bangle with hard solder. And I'm going to solder my jump ring closed using easy solder, since that's the solder that flows the quickest. It's going to be the fastest to get this jump ring on here. Now, with your bangle being so big and your jump ring being so small, we just want to place it nicely so that join is as far away from the bangle as it can be and really nestle this guy right in that little valley that you made in your kiln brick. And I want my join, like I said, to be kind of further away, there we go, from my bangle, so I don't accidentally solder it to the bangle itself. So my join is right here. Let's grab our easy solder. Just that small little dot, because the jump ring doesn't need much. Place it right on the join. And let's solder away. We just need a small flame for this. So I'm going to turn my torch down. And I'm going to just concentrate on the jump ring. Remember, the solder follows the heat of the torch flame. So if the solder moves a little bit, it's not the end of the world. There we go. You can see that solder's run molten. Looks good. Quench it. And let's pickle it one last time. Now let's take a look and see what we've got here. I'm going to dry it off. Oh, this is looking pretty. You can see here that the piece, though, isn't as shiny as you might want it to be. The silver's all matte. But I'm going to get my friend the Pro Polish Pad, and I'm going to go ahead and polish it up. You could also place this piece in the tumbler if you'd like. But the hammering makes this nice and work hardened. 
so it's a nice stiff bangle, but it's not gonna lose its shape. When the sample that I have for you to look at, you can also see that it's been antiqued. And you can certainly antique these pieces with the antiquing solution of your choice. I think it brings out the texture in the bangle nicely, but I also think they look great when they're just nice and shiny. And you can also check your seams. And if you feel like that little seam that you soldered needs a little bit of love, you can give it a little bit of filing with your jeweler's file. But this one actually looks pretty good. So I think we're good to go. All right, and here you have it. The twisted wire bangle. Okay, you guys, I wanna share one of my favorite tips with you. You know, we've made such a beautiful necklace and such a beautiful bracelet that you've gotta have some earrings to go with it. But you know what? Sometimes you just don't have ear wires, but now you're never gonna be without an ear wire because I'm gonna teach you a cool little trick to make them. It involves using an everyday simple pen that you might have laying around the house. It needs to have a cap on it and then what you're gonna need are two pieces of 20 gauge wire. I've cut them about two inches each. And of course, you're gonna need a couple of little wire wrap dangles for the actual drop of the earring. So this is how we do it. I've cut the end of my wire flush, and now with just the tip of my round nose plier, I'm gonna come in and rotate that loop right around so I have a little closed loop that looks like this. And I'm gonna do the same thing to this wire here. Now, go hunt around in your junk drawer and try and find one of those pens that you get from the hotels, right, that has a little lid on it, just like this. And all you're gonna do is that little loop, slide it right under the clip of the pen. Hold the clip down with your thumb and push the wire right around. We're gonna repeat that with our second wire. Just like so. Pull it around. Now, look at that, they're almost ear wires. Now I'm just gonna hold one right next to the other, so when I cut them, I'll cut them evenly. And what I wanna do is, I wanna cut these off nice and even, just a little further down from my loop, so they don't fall out of my ear. I have a little bit of that sandpaper to just file the end smooth so they feel comfortable going through my ear. Now all I need is my little flat chain nose plier and I'm just gonna come in and pull it in just so it gives me a little shape there at the end. And I'll do the same thing on the second one. Now, if I wanted to, I could come in and get my bench block and my chasing hammer and hammer these little ear wires flat if I felt like it, but I think these look terrific just as is. So I'm gonna go ahead and add my little dangles. I'm gonna open my loop, and I have a pre-wire wrapped pearl here, just like I used on my necklace project, and I'm just gonna close that back up just like so. And now I'm gonna repeat on the second one. 
open that up. See how I've just opened that loop right to the side. I can slip on my pearl and close it up. And now look, you guys, look at how easy and simple that was. You have a great pair of earrings to match your necklace and you'll never be without an ear wire. For more information about the supplies and techniques used, visit jewelschool.com. So who says that you have to go to a jewelry store to find beautiful jewelry? Hopefully now you can make it right at home. I know that you'll have the confidence and the know-how to make some beautiful pieces. Here are some of the pieces that we made today. You learned how to solder a component, add it to chain, and add some wire wrap dangles to embellish the necklace. You also learned how to make a beautiful hammered bangle. You learned how to twist the wire, solder it together, and add a sassy little stamped component to make it really, really shine. You also learned my favorite tip, which is how to make an ear wire just using an ordinary pen. I really hope you enjoyed yourself, because I sure did. And we'll see you next time in Jewel School.